thanks for joining everyone. I'm just gonna give it a few more minutes or a few more seconds for more people to log on. But we'll get started soon. Ah, there, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and get started. So hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for the return flight of the California Condor Destination Pacific Northwest webcast. My name is Ali Fisher and I'll be your MC for tonight. I'm the Wildlife and Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Associate for Oregon Wild. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce our guests. We have Ann Velisis, the president of Calmiopsis Audubon Society. She is an author and environmental historian who most recently wrote a book about the history of California's abalone, which is another imperiled West Coast species. She has also lived on Oregon's South Coast for two decades. We next have Kelly Walker, senior California condor keeper who has overseen the Oregon Zoo's, um, sorry, we now have Kelly Walker, Senior California Condor Keeper, who oversees the Oregon Zoo's Condor Conservation Breeding Program. She has worked with the program since 2004. I'd also like to include a land acknowledgement in this space. I would like to offer gratitude to the land itself and for those who have lived here in Oregon since time immemorial. I'd like to acknowledge the continuing presence of indigenous people on the land today, especially those who are working to return extirpated species back to their homelands. So more specifically, I'd like to acknowledge the leadership of the Yurok, whose ancestral territory includes the towering redwoods of Northern California, and the Nez Perce, whose ancestral territory spans throughout the Oregon-Idaho border, um, and both of their efforts to recover California condors. Um, you can see a map here of the Nez Perce's ancestral territory, um, followed by the Yurok's ancestral territory, and it's very close to the Oregon border, which is exciting for Oregonians who want to see condors in the future. However, it must be noted that this brand, brief acknowledgement can in no way capture the vast complexity and nuance that surrounds the history of tribes, the history between them and the federal government and individual states, as well as historical events, including colonial legacies and wrongdoings, like force removal that have had long lasting and current impacts. That being said, the most important thing to do is to not only acknowledge indigenous peoples and the land, but continue to do meaningful work by supporting them in the present, respecting and uplifting tribal sovereignty, doing your research and taking action. So just a few things to wrap up. Um, there will be a recording of this program that will be emailed out actually on Friday. Um, and will be posted on our website, OregonWild.org, in the WILD blog. Please enter your questions at any time through the Q&A section. We usually do get a flood of questions right at the end of the presentation, so the sooner you can get yours in, the easier it will be for me to organize, um, and then ask them after our guests have finished presenting. And then lastly, make sure to sign up at OregonWild.org for our next webinar on May 18th for a deep dive into Oregon's marine mammals. Now I'll pass it off to Danielle, our wildlife coordinator. Thanks so much, Allie. Uh, let's see. Great. Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, thanks everyone. I'm Danielle Moser. I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we're really excited to talk to you about condors. Uh, so I'm going to go over uh, the sort of long history of condors up into the recent past and then the even more recent um, restoration efforts and reintroduction that I'm sure many of you know about uh, since it was a, in a lot of our uh, promotional materials for this event. But so I'm going to kind of set the stage and then Anne and Kelly 
are, are gonna talk more specifically about uh, the nuts and bolts of some of the restoration and conservation efforts. And again, what this could mean for Oregonians who are excited to see condors return um, to our skies as well. So looking back and just thinking about the really long history here, um, you know, condors have been here for thousands of years. Um, we have evidence dating back well over 9,000 years. And actually we even have some that um, evidence that shows they were here even about 33,000 years ago. Um, so this is, you know, just to underscore that condors are native to this, to this part of our country. Um, and despite its name, it actually had a bigger range for, for many, 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 many years. Um, they've also, you know, they evolved and adapted at a time when there was big megafauna on the landscape, you know, the great woolly mammoth and mastodon and bison, uh, which is perhaps one of the reasons condors are so big. Um, they were there at a time when, when animals were much bigger um, than we see today, typically. <laughs> um, and so in archaeological, uh, excuse me, archaeological evidence shows that during the middle of the Holocene, which is the current period of geological time that we're in, their range reduced significantly to just about 200 miles from the Pacific Ocean. Um, and there's a couple of theories about why that was the case. Um, and, you know, perhaps it's a combination of theories as to why it happened. But essentially, the two main theories are that uh, as this big megafauna, you know, sort of headed its way toward extinction, especially from on terrestrial land, um, that there was less and less of this big megafauna, these big animals for, for um, condors, you know, to scavenge on at, as carry-on. And so that's one of the reasons, and it would have been kind of gradual over time, that eventually condors sort of moved their range closer to the ocean, uh, where marine life was still abundant. You can imagine a condor tearing into a, a whale, um, especially if they don't have, you know, bison or mastodons to do, to do that as well anymore. So that's one of the theories. The other one is that, um, you know, this kind of, the, their decline started to happen at a time where there was one of the biggest droughts um, that is known, at least from our perspective. And so, um, you know, there's some theory that perhaps with that drought, it really pushed them uh, to a, a more um, inviting environments that had, you know, had more water. And again, was, makes sense given that we know what the Pacific Northwest is like and um, being close to the ocean. So perhaps it's either of those or a combination, but essentially uh, the point here is that the condor range was much bigger across Western United States. Uh, and then, you know, thousands of years ago sort of moved to be within that 200 miles or so range of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so despite its name, uh, being California condor it is definitely native to all along the West Coast and obviously further out as well. And then skipping many years ahead, and sorry, there are some gaps, but these are, I kind of want to hit the top points of the history here. But, uh, and unfortunately, this is a story we probably all know far too well, but uh, the bigger, you know, the next sort of decline in the species population came after European colonization. Um, you know, the birds population uh, obviously was at risk due to shooting, poisoning, trapping, or capturing, um, and just sort of that over-exploitation of the species. Um, and again, it's something that I've given talks about wolves or sea otters or grizzlies, and it seems like it's all kind of the same, right? And so no, su no surprise here that condors also sort of fell victim to that over-exploitation, or at least this sentiment that, um, you know, perhaps they thought wildlife populations were limitless and um, there was no amount of harm they could really do uh, thinking that the populations were really big. Either way, it is kind of what precipitated the next major decline for the species. Then finally, um, and you know, we have some efforts sort of between that colonization and then in the 19th and 20th centuries to try to sort of curb some of these effects, of course. And, and we see, you know, conservation efforts underway. Um, passage of the Lacey Act happened, you know, in the 20th century, uh, which, which prohibited uh, hunting condors. Unfortunately, it seemed like at that time it was a little bit too, you know, too little too late, given the, the fact that the population was a little bit already at that point unstable. Finally, you kind of add in the fact that there's these indirect factors such as environmental pollutants like DDT, lead fragments, and, and poison from bait. And that really is what ultimately led to the demise of condors uh, in the wild. So not a fun history to tell, but I think it's important just for setting the stage and kind of understanding 
how we got to where we are. Um, and this this um, slide in particular shows you. So the one in the top left is a is a notice from the Department of the Interior, basically acknowledging acknowledging that perhaps TDT is having a negative effect on fish and wildlife. Which it's always easy to think here, you know, here and now, and say, okay, yeah, not surprisingly, but you know, this is how we evolve. We learn new things and we adapt. Um, so that's one of the Department of Interior notices. That middle picture is President Nixon signing the Endangered Species Act, um, which is coming up on its 50th anniversary next year. And, you know, an important and incredibly valuable bedrock environmental legislation that obviously has staved off extinction for a number of species, uh, you know, has helped many recover. Um, in fact, California condors were one of the first species put on the list. Um, but unfortunately, it was, again, a little bit too little too late by the time um, this, you know, that the ESA was signed and, um, and just given where the population was. So by 1982, as you can see in that caption, there was a meager 22 birds left in the wild. Um, and so I'm sure there was very difficult decision making, but essentially, you know, all, all the different entities and, and biologists and scientists came together to decide, you know, whether to bring in these condors into captive breeding to try to, you know, prevent full extinction and uh, protect any genetic diversity within, you know, these condors uh, or to obviously let them go extinct. So they decided to bring them into captivity and, and try to prevent extinction. And so you see that article from, on the right hand side um, talking about um, the last California condor to, to be captured and, and brought in. So that was in, in 1987. So really between 1987 to 1992, there were no free flying condors, um, no condors in the wild. I mean, this is the first time in thousands of years that our skies didn't have condors. And so while that is incredibly sad and frustrating, I'm sure in many ways, um, the good news is that on January 15th of 1992, uh, they did release two captive born and raised condors alongside two Andean condors back into the wild um, at Hopper Mountain National Wildlife Refuge, which is just Northwest of Santa Clarita, which is between LA and, and Santa Barbara. And so, you know, I think for me personally, this is sort of this moment of hope, renewed hope, this idea that despite what humans have done and, and some of the destruction we have caused, especially in way of our natural resources and wildlife, uh, that there are still moments and efforts that we can make to right historic wrongs. And so I think despite that history, you know, I'm, I'm so happy and, and feel again, a renewed sense of hope when I, when I think about this particular event and, and condors being released back into the wild. Okay, so then kind of now we're on this path back to recovery, um, which I would say we're probably still on, but at least we're making headway. And, and I know Kelly's gonna go into a lot more details. And in fact, this chart in particular is from the Oregon Zoo. So thank you for that. Um, but I think it does a great job of, of really showing you obviously, you know, over a timeline, kind of all the different significant dates and things that have happened in events uh, and just how it relates to the population, both in captivity and in the wild. And so, um, you know, I think the one thing to note, especially because that timeline only takes us up to 2012, is that at this time, most of the reintroduction efforts, the release sites were in Southern California, um, Arizona, and then up to Big Sur in, in California. So again, mostly in that sort of Southern historic range of condors. So clearly there was, uh, you know, still kind of a hole to be filled for the Northern part of California and of course the rest of the Pacific Northwest and, and West. And so that's where we see um, the Yurok tribe really kind of taking that leadership role. And of course, none of these are done in isolation. I mean, obviously partnerships with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with Oregon Zoo, with Ventana Wildlife Society, um, with, you know, the state, the Redwood State Parks, the national parks. But essentially the Yurok tribe, um, given both its ecological importance of condors in the wild, but also significant cultural importance and connection for the Yurok people to condors, uh, are who kind of, you know, are, have been spearheading and, um, and leading uh, this effort um, with uh, in, in Northern California. And, um, and so it's really exciting. And, you know, like Ali said, their ancestral homelands include 
the redwoods of Northern California and Klamath River area. And, um, and so this is a quote from Tiana Williams Clausen. She's the wildlife department director. Uh, and this is actually from a, a podcast that we did. And, and this is a quote she had in there, but I think it's important to, to underscore that cultural significance. And so, oh, sorry, went forward. Um, and then the other reason for highlighting the Nez Perce, um, which is again, uh, their ancestral homelands are on the Oregon Idaho border, including Hell's Canyon. And uh, they are also kind of underway looking into restoration efforts and a possible reintroduction into Hell's Canyon. And so, and then here you have a quote from Angela Sandana, um, who is also, you know, helping to lead those efforts um, for the Nez Perce tribe. And there are many more tribes in the region who have, you know, a cultural connection to condors, but I highlight these two um, because they are sort of leading those efforts with, act, you know, active reintroduction. And so, that's kind of you know setting the stage for for that breaking it into the the northern part of the range and and looking into bringing condors home to the Pacific Northwest and so um, excitingly uh, the Yurok tribe again in partnership with all the different entities I had listed before did end up releasing two condors last week on May third um, really exciting and again first time condors have been free flying this far north in over a hundred years. Um, so I'm gonna show you this video of the condors um, heading back out into the wild. So hopefully this works for you all. Oh, sorry, let me see what's going on there. So yeah, just a really, uh, it was a very magical moment to watch it. I'm so happy they were able to live stream it. Uh, and again, there's uh, Kelly and, and Anne are going to talk more specifically about what this means for Oregon. But suffice it to say, it's a really momentous occasion and, and just really exciting. And there's a lot of work to be done, but it's just, I feel a renewed sense of hope in, in watching condors return to the wild. Oh, sorry. Gosh flipping through quickly. So uh, I just want to end and um, this is a drawing that my my five year old did of a condor. Um, uh, please be kind. It, it's not exactly to scale in terms of uh, <laughs> the wingspan, but um, you know, he was five. So anyway, but he was inspired. We've been talking a lot about condors and reading about them. And so he came to me and, and shared this photo with me. And I thought it was, you know, of course, adorable as, as his mother, but in general, just it, it, that's kind of what I'm inspired by. And I hope you all are going to be just as excited as well. Uh, and finally, just want to end on a, on a personal story. I had the, I would say great fortune to see two condors, um, in Grand Canyon, I was out there for a visit and actually went to a ranger talk with one of the park staff. And as they're talking, two condors start flying overhead. And it was such a magical moment. And even the, the, the ranger was like, you know, this isn't like a planned thing. It's not like send in the condors, you know, like it just was a coincidence that they happened to be flying overhead at that time. And it's, it's hard to describe how powerful it is when you're in the presence of a condor and to really truly see that wingspan and be in the shadow of a condor. Um, but it's a magical moment. And I hope that, you know, as condors return to Oregon that you all will get to experience that as well. So thank you. And I'll turn it now to Anne. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Anne Delisis. I'm president of the Kalmyopsis Audubon Society, and I am absolutely delighted to be here tonight I'm celebrating this auspicious occasion with you all. Uh, I'm going to just say a few words about our organization. Kalmyopsis Audubon is located down on the south coast, and we've been uh, down there for about 40 years helping to protect and conserve the, out, the extraordinary um, natural landscapes of Southwest Oregon for bird, fish, and wildlife habitat. We've got about 400 members who care about, um, about that. And so anyway, we are extremely excited to be part in the part of Oregon and stewards of the part of Oregon that is nearest to the Yurok uh, reintroduction program. We applaud the efforts 
um, their efforts that are being made to restore condors and we join them in welcoming these magnificent birds back to their ancestral homelands. This is such a cool photo that I think gets at that giant wingspan that is so um, magnificent, absolutely magnificent. So this is a long-term conservation project that is occurring over many decades from that time, that, uh, that um, bottleneck time when the birds almost went extinct. It turns out condors raise just one chick per year. And the baton right now is being carried by the biologists at the Yurok tribe, the Oregon Zoo, Fish and Wildlife Redwood, Redwood National Park. Um, but with the birds now released into our bioregion, I think we will all have a role to play at this pivotal, pivotal time in making our place, making Oregon safe for condors into the future. So I wanted to show this picture to begin with, because when I kind of first started thinking about condors and the redwoods, I thought, gosh, I, where are they going to nest? You know, what, what are they going to do? Because I've always seen photos of condors in more desert landscapes where there's chaparral and cliffs and stuff. Um, but these photos are from the redwoods down near Big Sur. And it turns out that condors do find homes. I mean, and this was their ancestral homeland. And this, I think, is a super cool photo. It shows a condor nesting in the cavity of a burned out old tree showing, you know, that that these cavities that come after fires are so important for birds. And look how comfortable um, the bird looks there. And so anyway, it's helped me to see these photos to envision what it might be like to have condors back into the redwoods. Oops. Um, so as it turns out, even though we are very excited uh, to have the condors return to Oregon, we are going to just have to be patient for a while because it's going to be important for the condors, the juvenile condors that were just released that Danielle just showed the photos of, to stay really close to their release sites in Redwood National Park so that they have time uh, to learn from the guide birds that will be helping them to learn the ropes. And I hope Kelly will talk more about that um, and get to know their, their environment. The Redwood National Park is a really you know, large area where the habitat is going to be safe for them. So we, we really want them to stay uh, as long as they can and get their footing, so to speak. Um, but there was some recent um, research done that looked into condor flight and it analyzed very specifically how far condors can travel to get a better sense of the extent of the habitats used. And I just wanted to show you some maps that give you a sense of you know, what that might mean for Oregon. It turns out that uh, condors uh, can fly about 50 miles um, in a day on average. And so um, it's important to realize that, or to remember that condors are, they really rely on thermals, updrafts to move around. Um, anyway, so 50 miles or so would get us very close to the Oregon border um, in a day. But condors can fly in a day um, up to like 125 to 150 miles. So that really gets us into Oregon, closer up to Cape Blanco and out almost even towards Klamath Falls. And in this study, it turned out there was one condor that was about six years old that actually flew 250 miles or 200 miles in a day. And two days in a row, he flew 200 miles. So anyway, uh, you can sort of imagine and see that as um, that the condors will be spreading into Oregon. Um, but here's some other findings that maybe give us an idea of, of how this is going to happen. It turns out that older condors are the ones that travel long distances. And so it's probably because it takes the animals a while to get to know the landscape, get to gain confidence, get to uh, figure out how to get around and such. And so it's probably going to take a while for the, for the birds to age and, and gain that confidence before they'll be traveling those distances. Uh, the, the study also found that nesting condors travel farther than non-nesting adults, and that's probably because um, they can roost closer. The nesting condors have to fly back to the nest to bring food back to their uh, chick, whereas the non-nesting condors can roost closer to a carrion site. So anyway, that's another reason. Um, 
And then condors flew farther in the summer, and that's likely because thermal uplifts are more common with the warmer weather. And then the final and important finding of this um, research was that the farther condors travel, they end up getting exposed uh, to greater risks. And that's because uh, they are generally released into wildland sites. So they have all this habitat where they're where they can be safe and protected. And the farther they go, they encounter uh, more threats. So I'm just want to show, um, you know, what can a condors expect when they do show up in Oregon? And I'm really psyched to say that I think they're going to find safe and excellent habitat as a result of decades of conservation effort. And I don't have a really great map to show, but I just want to say down here is where the redwood and state national parks are, then there's the Smith River National Recreation Area, and then just over the border, there's the Calmeopsis Wilderness and all of these wildlands around it. Um, so that's uh, a huge block of wildlands that we have in Southwest Oregon um, as a result of decades of conservation effort. So we've also got the Oregon Redlands that Oregon redwoods that were protected in the 1990s um, as a result of activism by Oregon Wild and our Audubon chapter, Calmeopsis Audubon. We've also got the greater Calmeopsis wildlands, as I mentioned. This is the canyon of the Illinois, Wild and Scenic Illinois River. We've got the Wild and Scenic Chetco and the North Fork Smith. These canyons might be places that the condors will find. This is actually near a place called Buzzard's Roost. Um, buzzards kind of sounds like a derogatory name for a condor, but maybe it means that it's the kind of place that um, that the condors will find. And perhaps even most important is the, all the habitat we have protected along the coast. We've got an amazing system of coastal state parks that Samuel Boardman started working to conserve back in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago. And it turns out the parks and the coastal habitat may prove important because um, research shows that condors that spend more time in coastal habitats have higher survival rates. And that's probably because of uh, the food sources and also lower exposure to lead. I wanna mention that we have these wonderful, a wonderful system of state parks, but we've also got ranches um, working landscapes interspersed between. And I'm just really pleased to say that we've got some wonderful ranchers on the South Coast that are very excited and happy to welcome our condors back as well. So that's um, gonna be a wonderful thing. So um, as I mentioned, one of the things in Danielle too, on the coast, we've got, we still have large marine mammals and they become of special interest to condors when they turn into carcasses. Um, it's interesting because I've actually seen a lot of carcasses walking on beaches down in Southwest Oregon. And I've kind of marveled at how long they take to decompose. It's a whale. My friend Jordan photographs this giant blue whale on a beach that washed up a couple of years ago. And um, it turned out they decided to dismantle it to save the skeleton and um, to show up in a museum up in Newport. But the blubber that they removed literally lasted for several years on the beach and, and the odor remained as well. So it really kind of points to the fact that we um, need predators to do this job um, and it points um, to the fact that basically we haven't had them, that condors are actually the ones that can do this. They've got um, powerful bills that can tear into the tough hides and um, they open up these carcasses and make them available to a whole bunch of other birds and wildlife in the ecosystem that can use them. So it's one of these situations where I didn't even realize that condors were missing from the ecosystem, but it turns out they are kind of this missing link in our coastal ecosystem. So when they are restored, they will be bringing that back, that wholeness back, which is super exciting. Oh yeah, there they are. Just a little bit in, inland on our coastal plain, we also have large, other large an animals, elk, the Roosevelt elk, of course, 
also become carcasses. And this leads me to talk to some of the threats that condors will continue to face and the work that we need to start doing now to help make sure that, um, that condors will find a safe place to come when they make it to Oregon. So yeah, Danielle was explaining that one of the reasons, and it's the biggest reason um, that condors face a demise has to do with lead poisoning. And it turns out that lead poisoning is still the biggest single threat to condors. 51% of all condor deaths are still caused by lead poisoning. And the way it works is that the lead ammunition used in hunting, it fragments upon impact. Here's a, you can see um, in this x-ray how the bullets kind of, or the shrapnel kind of gets spread throughout the carcass. And so when condors ingest that, um, it basically begins to poison them. Because, and of course they are eating gut piles, they're eating carrion, so they're, they're super vulnerable. And there you can see, yeah, uh, another x-ray of the shard ending up right in the condor's stomach. So to address this issue, California recently banned the use of lead ammunition in hunting. And that's, uh, that ban took full, in full effect in 2019. But people can still buy lead ammunition to use at target areas. And apparently with the pandemic supply issues, it's been harder to find the alternative, which is copper bullets. And here you can see the difference. Uh, on the left side is the lead ammunition. It fragments, it goes all over the place. Um, this is a problem, uh, was a problem with hunting waterfowl and uh, lead ammunition was, uh, outlawed in national wildlife refuges to try to prevent this problem from um, harming waterfowl. On the right side, you see copper um, bullets, which, which don't have that problem at all. And so um, there's also been efforts to educate hunters on, on this. And that's really the approach that started so far in Oregon. Um, we're gonna have to figure out how we wanna deal, it, deal with it. But so far the Nez Perce tribe, the Oregon Zoo and Portland Audubon have been reaching out to hunters to try to begin the process of educating them um, about why they might want to switch over to copper ammo. I think one of the things that would inspire hunters to shift um, is not only protecting condors and wildlife, but because the meat that they're bringing home to their families is also has this lead in it and is also can be poisoning. Um, so of course, lead has all sorts of health effects on human life as well and on wildlife. So anyway, these are um, that's gonna be the big issue that we're gonna have to figure out. And if there's any hunters out there who have ideas about how we can communicate this, let me know. We're, gonna, we're all gonna have to brainstorm about that. A few other things um, that are also a problem for condors um, is, that um, condors are incredibly curious. And so they love to find little glimmering pieces of things like little pieces of glass or bottle caps, things like that, tr trash that's left in the environment, microplastics could be a problem. They bring them back and um, unfortunately feed them to their chicks because they don't realize obviously that they're plastics. And so here a study from 2007 found that um, junk that was ingested by chicks would either end up getting, um, here's, you can see a bunch of what was stuck in the gizzard of one chick nestling. And then another that shows um, it goes into the stomach of the birds. And so it has the impacts of, you know, causing the birds to starve or have stunted growth and even die these nestlings. So that's also a problem. On the South Coast, we are already familiar with the need to be careful with trash in relation to conserving our marbled murrelets. For a different reason, um, trash can attract in predators that go after marbled murrelets in their nest. And so we already have campaigns about keeping clean camps and not leaving trash um, around for that reason. So with the release of the condors, we're gonna have even more reason to keep uh, camps clean. 
And I just want to mention um, that the carcasses of marine mammals carry the risk of toxins too, of course. In Southern and Central California, birds have been exposed to DDE, a metabolite of DDT that has caused thinning of their eggshells. And, you know, Southern California, of course, is the site of a famous spill of DDT. Up here in Northern California and Southern Oregon, where our water is so much cleaner, I'm hoping we will not, we will not be having that problem, thank heavens. And so I just wanna end with a few ways that uh, we can all start to think about helping California condors. First of all, just let's spread goodwill and excitement about condors return so everybody can be excited about it and want to support this effort. I think we need to think about our wild places as habitat for wildlife. And that is you know, all the responsibilities that go with taking care of garbage and, and using non-lead ammunition and supporting conservation of habitats. All that stuff is stuff we can continue to do. Donate to condor restoration. Uh, one good place that you can go is to go to the Yurok Tribe's Condor live stream, which is a fun place to pay attention and look at what is happening to the condors. And there's a place you can also donate there. And finally, when we get them, we should report our condor sightings. And I think it's not exactly clear yet where you should report them. So please report them, you know, report them to us at Calmeopsis Audubon or to Oregon Wild if you're an Oregon Wild member or to the zoo if you're a zoo member. Um, and that way we can make sure they get to the right place and we can all continue to learn and share information. So I am just looking forward to the day that we can all be celebrating the arrival of California condors in Oregon. And I hope that they will have a safe and return to the Northwest. So thanks very much all. And I'll turn it over to Kelly. Hey Kelly, just to jump in here, go ahead and talk until like 6.55 or so, and then I'll extend the webinar um, around to 7.10 to answer some questions. All right, are you sure? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, hold on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh no. Just. Sorry. Can you, you probably can't see my screen, can you? Not right now. There we go. I'm sorry. Got it? Looks great. Okay. Apologies. That's why I work with animals. Um, so I'll kind of um, tear through these um, pictures real fast uh, so we can answer your questions. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit, well, a lot about our breeding program and, and kind of what we would like to see. Um, this initial picture is a wild condor, um, set book number 340. He was the first one to be released from the Oregon Zoo, and that is his newly hatched chick in a wild nest. Um, our condor facility is on 52 acres. Um, we have 16 breeding pens. We currently have 54 birds, um, 12 chicks right now, one egg um, we're going to hope hatches soon. Um, this picture is uh, of our breeding pens. You've got some black visual barriers. So our pens are very large. Um, they are 35 feet tall by 50 feet long by uh, 25 feet wide. Um, so the birds do have some room to move and it's very isolated. So there, there's no people really. Um, this is what an adult condor looked like. Uh, I just like this picture because again, it's 340 and that's uh, in the wild with his mate, Tiny. And then right behind is uh, their chick. That was that was last year when they when the biologists were doing a chick health check. Um, so we monitor all of our condors um, by a cam camera probably ninety five percent of the time. We don't want any of our condors um, to see us, especially the chicks. That we don't want them to associate people with food or with really anything positive. So everything we try to do is mostly on camera or behind the scenes. So this time of year, um, we're keeping close track of the nest rooms. Um, like I said, we've got um, 12 chicks in nest rooms and this view is of all of our nest rooms. And on the left side, you can see there's a nest room with an egg in it. And then 
all of those other birds in there are um, sitting on eggs or chicks. So that's how we monitor um, kind of what's going on in um, the nest room. And then we also have cameras um, outside pan tilt zooms, um, how we monitor birds on the outside when they're in the pens, when they're feeding, breeding, all of that good kind of stuff. Um, so we can see anywhere in the facility really at any time. Um, that lovely picture down on the lower right is um, of calves being fed uh, out to our Proving These pen. That's literally what we do. We shut the doors, we hug the calves in the room, and then open the doors and the birds um, drag out the food themselves. Again, they do not see us uh, putting any food in. It's like a magic food room. Um, so our pens, like I said, are pretty large. Uh, you can see in your upper left, there's a condor um, that's actually 421, the male, sitting up on um, the snag. And all of our pens have large snags in them. They have a, a pool. Um, condors do love water. They take a bath. It can be 32 degrees, but if it's sunny, they're taking a bath. Um, and they also like to dip all of their food in, which is disgusting, but that's what they do. Um, the barns, you can see those are our breeding barns. The two lower doors um, get closed. That's where the food goes in um, and they open uh, and the birds go in to feed. That's also where we catch our condors. Um, we do not catch them unless like a wildfire. Uh, in the pens, um, it's dangerous for the birds, dangerous for us, and it gets everybody upset. So we do catch them in smaller spaces. The top window that you see is actually the entrance to their nest room. So their nest room is on the second story. Um, that's just, this is a little bit closer view um, of like the nest room in the sandbox. I think one of my pictures got cut off, but um, we've got two words. We've got what's called um, egg doors. Uh, they're low in um, the wall. And it's what keepers use to uh, reach through when the birds are not there and switch out a real eggs and dummy eggs or chicks or such. It is a little bit reflective. So some of the birds do like to look at themselves, um, which is actually kind of amusing. Uh, I went over this, uh, we've got 54 birds. We've got three males on exhibit, um, 12 chicks in total. We've had 153 eggs and 108 have hatched. So, and I believe we've released 73 condors to the wild at this point. Uh, there's our incubation room. Uh, we do incubate every condor egg. Um, there's, a, there's a few reasons for it, but specifically it's not because condors can't raise their own eggs. Um, they can, but because we're in a breeding facility, um, aggressions tend to run a little bit higher because you've got condors kind of stacked on each other. So condors tend to be more aggressive and that can, um, spill over into the nest room and eggs can get broken or injured unintentionally. So we bring everything up, put a dummy egg in there and that's what they sit on. Um, so those are just eggs in the incubator on the left. And then over, you'll see an actual fertile egg. That's what we look for. We look for the nice vesseline. There's the embryo kind of up at the top of the egg with the eye spot. We've uh, written on there, that's the egg's ID number. Um, and occasionally, in, like in the lower right, we do x-ray uh, eggs if maybe that we're not seeing what we think we should be seeing when a chick's hatching, just to make sure the position of that chick is okay. So we do x-ray and do CTs. Um, this egg, um, I'll just go through this real quick. Malpositioned, um, it wasn't progressing like we wanted. So we figured out where the beak tip was. The picture on the left, You'll see the hole in the egg, and then you'll see kind of a pink thing down at the kind of the bottom side of the hole. That is the wing. Right behind that is like a gray spot with a, a white tip. That is the beak. That is called a malposition, and it's head under um, wing. There's no way this chick can hatch because that beak can't reach the shell. So what I did was very gently with sterile Q-tips, uh, kind of uh, lifted that wing up, pulled the beak out and put the wing behind the beak. So now your beak is actually hitting up against your shell. Um, you put some um, sterile kind of like a cardboard thing, seal that back up and the chick can actually then hatch, rotate and hatch. And uh, it, it, it's worked brilliantly. 
Uh, and then this uh, is a chick that wasn't doing brilliant. We hatched it out. Um, it can take three to seven days to actually get the chick out of the egg. It's not necessarily a one day process. Um, the chick did fine. Uh, we put it in the ICU um, and actually put it under parents the next day. It just had some issues. And this is what it looks like the next day. So the chick is dry. We do something um, that's called a rehatch. So um, make sure the umbilicus is sealed, um, that it's produced fecal, can lift its head up. So we take a, uh, a sterile egg, an egg that we've sterilized that was, that was infertile, cut it, um, stick the chick back in there, and then tape on the top um, and put it under parents so it hatches under the parents. Um, and we've had really, really good luck uh, that way. The chicks are very angry, but, it's, but it works. Uh, this is what um, our kind of 60 day, there's a 30 day chick, which is your upper left. That's what a kind of a 30 day chick looks like. That giant thing on the front of them is this crop. Uh, there is the redwood chick. Uh, that's about 60 days. They just went in and wing tagged uh, that particular bird. Um, and then uh, you can just kind of see in the nest room, um, there's an adult there and that's, that's what the nest room looks like. It's very basic. Uh, there's sand on the floor, there's stuff all over it, but that's what they have in the wild. They've got, um, you know, there's no nest building, no anything. Uh, that's just another kind of picture, <laughs> sorry, that caps. Um, we do have our pre-release uh, pen that's actually extremely large. Right now we have 12 birds in our pre-release pen. This is where we put um, the chicks, they're about eight months old, out of the breeding pens. We wing tag them and put them in a pre-release pen where they spend about a year. This particular pen um, has a, um, a mock power pole on it um, that runs electricity uh, um, along the top. It's a power pole conversion therapy. Um, so whenever the juveniles, if they land on it, they get a shock and it's unpleasant. Um, they learn not to land on those. They were losing condors about 20 years ago um, by landing on power poles in the wild and their wingspan so big that they would electrocute themselves. This has actually worked so well, um, and they have it in the release facilities that we haven't lost a condor to power pole, uh, landing on power poles since this was installed. Uh, here, real quick, is um, a couple of the uh, release sites. The one on the left is at Pinnacles. Um, our bird is inside, and there are two birds outside uh, just checking out the fresh meat coming in. They like to check everything out. Uh, the one on the right is Bitter Creek down in Southern California. Um, again, you can see the wild birds on top. Um, just checking out to see who's in there. Uh, this was, I just threw this picture in because you can now see like how small a kind of a, that's probably a three day old chick, how small that chick is in comparison to the size of, of the adults. Um, it's pretty amazing. They grow to adult size in six months from that. Um, this is, sorry, uh, but this is what lead looks like um, to condors and biologists that study them. This particular picture on the right um, is a green female condor in Arizona. Her tracker sent off a mortality signal. Um, you can see the wing drags um, and the footsteps and she, she can't fly any longer. Um, she's starving to death. And this is, so this is what we're facing um, with lead poisoning. Um, she, was, she was dead at the end of this, but um, that's what lead poisoning looks to, uh, like to our program. Uh, right now, official numbers are about 537 birds total. We probably have a little bit more than that because we have all of our chicks hatching. Um, so there's about 330 uh, birds in the wild. Um, so we're getting there from 22. Uh, and this is, this is the face that we see right before we get something like a bleeding type wound. Um, but they're beautiful birds. The adults, their eyes are red. They've got that massive beak for breaking into carcasses. Um, they um, are very colorful birds. They have air sacs uh, all over the place. And you can tell a lot about um, how a condor is feeling 
um, by uh, the color they make their skin. If it's really, really bright, uh, it means something like in breeding, they color up. When they're angry or stressed, they uh, go almost a white um, and those air sacs are all sucked up. So they're actually very, um, they have lots of expressions, these birds, um, and it's very interesting to watch. So I flew through that because I knew we were running out of time. So, um, and that is a flying wild color, which is cool. And they look like airplanes. They look like small airplanes. You kind of can't mistake them. Um, so that's what I did. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, Sorry, that was <laughs> <laughs> you did great. Um, I'll go ahead and get started with the Q&A because um, we do have quite a few questions from the audience, which is great. Um, so this first one, what do you think the most effective way is to advocate for requiring lead-free shot? Do you think there's any way to recruit um, like Cabela's or any other places that sell um, outdoor stuff? Um, uh, I'll just throw this out there. Um, we have uh, somebody employed by the Oregon Zoo, Leland Brown, who um, his job is to do lead outreach um, and he's very, very good at it. Uh, he goes around to all the organizations, all the shows, he does shows. Um, he has always told us, don't talk to hunters about hunting if you don't hunt yourself. Um, which I think is solid, um, because coming from somebody like me, I don't hunt, but do you want to hunt? Absolutely hunt there. It's so good for our birds. If you, um, you know, leave clean carcass piles, all of that, it's actually great for the environment and, so, and hunters are some of the best environmentalists out there and they put money into the system. Um, so there's no way we would ever advocate for like, we don't want hunting. We just want clean hunting. Um, given that it's consumer driven. Um, so it's kind of a catch 22, you go in and you ask for lead free, but if they don't have it, you can't buy it. And then, so, but it is consumer driven. The more people that ask for lead free ammunition, uh, the more is going to be available. Um, but that's just my take on it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, I think that, and I think just in, you know, the general education for all people like Anne was talking about, there's, you know, there's a lot that we will definitely have to do and ramp up to scale. I think that's, you know, Leland I, and I've met him and does amazing work. It's hard only being one. So we need sort of like 500 Leland's <laughs> in order to right. be fully effective across the state. So I guess, to, you know, to be determined, but yeah, appreciative of all the, all of the efforts for sure that have been already underway. So um, we will see. <laughs> All right. And then here's another one for you, Kelly. Um, how many condors have hatched at the Johnson Center so far this year? This year, we have 12, um, which last year we had 10 and that was record. And then now we have 12. Um, so we're very excited. Um, we still have one in the incubator. It's on day 45 um, and they incubate for about 54 days, but it's developing normally. Everything looks great. I don't want to jinx myself. Um, so hopefully um, we'll have 13 this year, which is fantastic. Awesome. And then another kind of related one to the work that you do, Kelly, um, we're getting a lot about this. Um, <laughs> how many eggs need assistance with hatching? Um, any thoughts you have on that? Yeah, not very many. I mean, maybe every year uh, we might have one or every other year um, we might have one. Usually they're, um, they do okay. Um, and we don't know. Um, the thing is, like, would they have died naturally? Um, Maybe, but also because we put them in an incubator, we don't know, does the incubator maybe cause um, some malpositions or something else cause malpositions? And if we can save the chick, um, we're gonna do it because um, we, we need those chicks. Um, and we're not at a point where, you know, just because it is slightly malpositioned, but it's still a healthy chick that we're gonna let it die. So usually not that much interference, but occasionally, yeah, we, we gotta get in there. 
Okay, next question. Um, how many con how are the condors doing in Utah and Arizona? Um, um, they're actually so yeah, they've started um, they have a huge lead outreach program in Arizona as well, and they've started doing um, lead outreach in Utah. And they had was it last year they had the first nest fledgling um out of um utah so they're they're actually doing great um pretty much condors are doing exactly what they need to be doing everywhere they're finding their own food they're breeding they're raising their young they're expanding their their range so they're actually very successful um we just keep taking uh hits because when you lose an adult condor it takes like eight to ten years to get to breeding age so if you lose that um statistically it takes a little over three chicks being put into the wild to equal one adult condor um so every adult breeding condor is 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 a lot gotcha and then this was mentioned in a few of the presentations about some of the challenges that condors are facing um, but this question is asking if there are any occurrences of wind turbine or aircraft collision um, on record for condors no, that no. Um, yeah, you don't want to be an airplane if you have <laughs> um, But the the wind farm people um, have um, most. Uh, there's a few companies that have actually worked really closely with the Condor Project, um, and are trying to put their wind farm wind farms, you know, not in like a Condor flight path. Um, coming up with um, trying to figure out, you know, how um, if a condor comes into that area, you know, can we turn the turbines off? Can we, it's just kind of an ongoing discussion, but they're very, very conscientious um, of the impact that it, it would have. Um, and like Avangrid um, has uh, donated quite a bit of money to really uh, help our program and hire another keeper to release more birds. So they, they are doing a fantastic job. Ironically, there is an airline called Condor. Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, presumably they're doing the best by uh, <laughs> going right? There There's also a, a drone company, and maybe that's what you're thinking of, that's called the Condor. And that's actually an issue we have on the coast, Kelly. We're going to be looking at uh, drone regulations in Oregon. And I've wondered about how they might affect our mm -hmm. condors as well. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of sketchy because, you know, you, you, I mean, the chicks are in their nest and a drone could just fly up and that sucker will jump out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just the whole responsibility thing, yeah. Yeah, and I actually do have a question for you that's kind of related um, to what you're saying. So are there ways to protect additional habitat in Southern Oregon to make our place more receptive to condors? Well, gosh, uh, yeah, I mean, we as I mentioned, we've got all these wildlands around the Kalmyopsis wilderness that are roadless areas that probably could use more protection someday. Um, but I think the ongoing threats, things like uh, drones that we're seeing, things uh, like we've discussed uh, are parts of how we have to make sure our, our land, that we're protecting our, our fabulous and extraordinary natural resources down here, our wonderful wildlands. Um, so anyway, I think more is better. We, we live in a really special place that has one of the largest wildland blocks, probably one of the largest wildland blocks that remains unprotected. And so that's something we're always trying to figure out how we can do, how we can do more of, how we can protect better. Well, and sort of related to this, I mean, it's not habitat per se, but, and you brought this up and, you know, just, you know, when there is a washed up whale, sort of also changing the mindset that, you know, and I understand there's definitely research needs and I, I, I get that, but sort of this idea like, oh, well, we need to clean up the carcass, you know, which we, right. without condors, we, and probably for other scavengers too, but especially for condors, we've kind of gotten into that mindset. So, you know, perhaps with some of our coastal alliance folks saying, no, actually leave those carcasses, especially as condors are returning. That's a good point, Danielle. I was actually reminded, I think a couple of years ago, it was the 50th anniversary of this ridiculous story of um, Oregon exploding a whale up near 
<laughs> Florence to get rid of it. And it, that just made me think too about, oh, we need condors. And so how cool that will be to not have that problem in, in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, the questions are really piling in. So gonna keep on going. Um, so what is the goal for global population of condors? Obviously we want as many as possible, but if there's like, I don't know, benchmark where, okay, if we have this many condors, then we're in pretty good shape. Yeah, I mean, originally the, the program started out with like the standard, oh, we need like 2000, you know, to do a self-sustaining population. Um, that kind of got taken off the table a few years ago because this population is so dynamic. Um, so we are still going towards a self-sustaining population, but really um, until we address uh, the main threat to condors and really get that cleaned up, we don't, we don't have a goal because right now we're just kicking out as many as, as possible. Um, and they are, they're trying to redefine that whole language. Like, what does it mean to have a self-sustaining population? Um, when, when is enough? When can they, you know, so that is actually an ongoing, um, conversation and we, I, we just don't have those numbers right now. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, Kelly, if you could speak a little bit on the wing tags, um, and how they're attached, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so every condor, um, has, uh, a wing tag and it's, it's usually like the last two numbers of their stud book number. Every condor that gets hatched gets a number, um, like three, four, five, six. So, um, and that's the way we follow them and identify them. Um, so forgive my example. So, okay. A condor. <laughs> Thing is, it's kind of like this, like here's the, the big long feathers and um, like secondaries. So, and here's your humerus. So literally the wing tag goes in kind of right above the elbow in between the, um, there's a tendon that's, that stretches here and then your other bone and muscles. So um, we use a piercing needle um, and, um, Pierce, and then we uh, kind of put the wing tag on and it's secured by uh, a bolt and a locking nut, which is covered with um, shrink wrap plastic so that you don't have just like metal on your skin. And then, um, and then your wing tag. Um, condors actually, for some reason, it doesn't bother them. Um, and it's always kind of surprising because, you know, I mean, it's uncomfortable. Um, but even with the juveniles when they're released and they're just like, all right, whatever. Um, so those get attached, and then um, also they will get uh, a radio uh, radio transmitter um, on one or both of their wings, and that is also secured on that wing tag. Um, so it's actually it's a it's a pretty quick process. We do um, medical checks in the field, and us we do uh, check that area to make sure that if the bird is um, yarding on it that that potential hole doesn't get get large and um mess with that whole thing because uh, that'll mess with the tendon and the bird's health and ability to fly awesome thank you um let's see do condors in the wild migrate in the winter i'm sure there's like some visibility differences between the seasons but um any insight you have on that I don't think we know. Um, the population's not big enough. Um, and we'll probably start to find out as they come north. Um, but we have no idea. Um, they might maybe in their upper range, but there's um, data um, and, and histories that show that they did nest in Oregon. Um, but I don't, I, yeah, I, we don't know. Okay, and then we have a question um, about condors and their nesting habitats. Um, so if Kelly or someone could talk a little bit about um, what condors really do to nest because they don't do what a lot of other birds do. 
No, they just lay an egg in a hole. Um, yeah. Um, the, some of them, it's surprising um, when you go, when the biologists go do a nest entry to uh, do a health check or whatever, they like literally have to crawl in there. The condors will nest in, in very small spots. There's also some um, cavities that are like a huge dome um, and they'll nest in the redwoods. Some of them are in sheer cliffs. Others, um, you can literally walk into the nest area. Um, so the nesting is variable. Um, they don't make a nest. They just lay the egg directly onto that substrate. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the chick usually fledges at about uh, five or six months. Um, sometimes from a height and like has to make a crazy flight and sometimes um, it's a little bit easier. So it's, it's really variable what they'll choose and what they like to do. That is so interesting. They don't have like sort of a typical characteristic for the <laughs> for a cavity or, you know, that is fascinating. Yeah. And some of them are just like, why would you choose that? But yeah, I work to them. So yeah. Especially yeah. infrequently they're laying an egg. You would think they'd be like, this is the most, <laughs> you know, right? like prized possession. <gasps> Gotta hide this. Yeah. I know. I always love seeing the photos of condors nesting in redwoods just because it's like, it's such a cool site. Um, yeah. All right. Um, we have a few more minutes. So let's see. Do either of you know if there have been any specific incidents with drones being a problem for condors in any of the release sites? Or is this like a potential thing that condors could um, be affected by? Oh, there's definitely a potential. I mean, yeah, drones can disturb anything. But um, as far as I know, um, I have not heard any disturbances at any of the release sites. I could be wrong, but I don't think we've run into that problem yet, although I'm, I'm sure we will eventually. Great, and then let's see, I'm trying to choose the last question. Um, let's go with this one. Could one of you speak on some of the factors that condors need? Um, so like what determines where these condors can actually be released? Um, they've done um, a lot of research uh, with thermals. So ideally you need, um, you'll see a lot of, um, I think actually all of the release sites are on a steep hill um or like atop a cliff um because they need that to get going um you don't want to put one into a sink um so they they do have that going for them and the wind's coming up um it need it has to it should have the ability to be isolated somewhat from people um they are surrounded by large electric fences that's to keep not only people but like bear and um, cougar and stuff away from the actual uh, release pen. Um, you do need the ability to get there um, because you do need to haul in food um, for the condors. So you usually have like a, um, um, some sort of storage locker um, that you put large purposes in. You have to have access somehow to water. Um, that being said, there, um, and you have to, uh, you kind of want to be somewhat near uh, maybe a vet facility or um, a zoo in case you get a hurt or sick condor, you can get there, um, you know, in less than a day's trot time. Um, so those are, are some constraints. Um, also, you need um, agreements from, you know, park services and um, an MOU. Uh, and depending on uh, if you have a 10J or a, a specifically endangered bird. Um, so those are just some of the considerations. Um, but really, there's a lot of gorgeous places to choose from. Um, and a lot of times, it's the people who, um, the biologists who are releasing the birds and the condo project will be like, okay, we're looking at a site. 
Um, and you'll go around and look at several different sites, pluses, minuses. Um, that's kind of how the, the Yurok tribe chose, chose their site. It was kind of a well agreed upon area. And I'll just add too that um, as part of the Condor Reintroduction Program, they do quite um, extensive feasibility studies about sites that have to do with environmental contaminants too. And so before the Yurok could start their program, they, there have been studies done to look specifically at the toxin, toxin load of other birds that eat carrion or and also in like marine mammals. So um, that was one of the reasons I think people have been excited about Northern California um, being a possibly great site to help enhance the wild condor population because we do have great uh we have good quality habitat here and so um that's a wonderful thing as well and the last time i talked to angela with the nez Perce, that that's kind of again to your point that was their first thing is the this habitat assessment and that was really like is it you know is this even feasible does this make sense given all the all the new factors and so i think they've come through that and are now in sort of that next phase but that was at least where they were for a bit Well, we are past time, so I'm going to have to close up the webinar, but thank you all so much for your great presentations. Thank you to everyone in the audience for your great questions, and we're sticking around for a few extra minutes. Um, and yes, this recording will be available on Friday um, if you'd like to watch again. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Take care. Thank you.